Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you out. We decided to have a almost semi-summer day after the last couple of days, and so it's good to see you. I ask you, if you would, take your Bibles to and turn to uh, Habakkuk chapter 3. We bring our study in Habakkuk to a close uh, today, and I trust that it's been a blessing to you and a rich study for all of us. And we come to a great chapter. It ends in a great fashion because we've been walking with Habakkuk through all of his dark journey, so to speak. And he's, he's gotten answers from God as God's interacted with him. And those are answers that he didn't necessarily want because he knew the ramifications of what was about to take place. And he didn't know when the end game was. He didn't know a lot of things, but he comes to a point of worship and praise. And, and so it's a, it's a great place. And, you know, each and every one of us have those times in our lives, these dark seasons that we go through. Some are really, really dark, and some are not so dark when we compare them to others. I've had my share of them. I could kind of rehearse them a little bit in my own mind at different times where um, I've struggled with this or that, what God was doing or what, uh, you know, what the circumstances that I faced in. And, and those are always difficult times to walk through and to uh, keep your joy and to hang on to your faith. And um, I can remember a period of time in my ministry here at Calvary Bible Church where at the top of my prayer list was uh, the number one request was stay or quit. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Do you talk about quitting Calvary Bible Church? No, that's not what I was talking about. It was stay in the ministry or quit the ministry. That's how discouraged I was, how frustrated, and, and just didn't understand what was going on and why. And, and, and those deep, dark, discouraging times are difficult to go through. And I can remember praying fervently during that time, God, what do you want me to do? And, and uh, just trying to wait on him. And, and that... that prayer request was on the top of my prayer list for several years as I struggled with the Lord and, and all of that. And, and so I kind of get what Habakkuk's going through in, in some senses. Uh, he's not talking about quitting the ministry, but I, I, I'm pretty sure he's not really liking his responsibility of delivering a message to the nation of Israel or Judah in particular that judgment is coming. And God is going to utilize Babylon as his instrument. And last week we ended our time in study of chapter 2 that uh, examining that there are three things we must do if we're going to follow God during these difficult times. And, and the most important one, the one that stands out above all the other two, is that we must live by faith in the dark times or the discouraging times. And, and, but the question always becomes, we hear that, we use that phrase in, in our Christian circles a lot. You, know, you just got to live by faith. You know, you just got to trust God. Well, what does that really mean? How do I do that? How do I do that when my circumstances are putting me on edge and I, I'm not sure that I can walk through this another day? What does it really mean? Well, Habakkuk provides the perfect real life example of what it means to live by faith in the dark and difficult times. His worry, as we will see as we work our way through chapter three, his worry is now turning to worship. And so therefore we have a lot to learn from um, um, a man like Habakkuk as he faces his uncertain times and we face ours. I mean, there, are, there are some of us who are very, very much concerned about the future of our nation or the future of whatever that we're going through. There's any number of uncertainties that we can come to. And so how do we walk by faith? How do we live by faith? And, you know, after, here's a couple of things I want to share as well, that after God's response to Habakkuk, he had a better understanding of what God meant when he promised in chapter 1, verse 5, that he was doing a work. He told Habakkuk, look at the nations, I'm doing a work. And, and now Habakkuk has a better understanding of what that, all, that is all about. Clearly, this was not what Habakkuk wanted. It was not what he wanted to hear. It was not what he wanted to experience or live through. However, even though it has been a tough journey for him, a journey of faith, we see him holding on to the fact that God has been faithful in the past, and he's counting on him that he will be faithful in the present and in the future. 
That's what he's holding on to, as we'll see. And we cannot miss this critical point, that it is God's character, not our circumstances, but God's character that is lifting him out of the valley of despair to the heights of faith that we will see in chapter 3. See, here's the point that we want to start with this morning. Circumstances cannot rob us of our hope and joy when we rest in the faithfulness of God. We, we, we can remain joyous. We can remain hopeful in the deepest and darkest circumstances when we rest in the faithfulness of God, not in our circumstances. And we're going to see that over and over again. Now, it's imperative that as we get ready to look at chapter 3, it's imperative to note that Habakkuk's circumstances have not changed, nor has his comfort level. God's still going to bring judgment. God's still going to discipline the nation. He's still going to use Babylon. Babylon is an evil nation. Nothing has changed for Habakkuk. He's cried out to God on two occasions. He's made his complaint. God has responded. Nothing has changed. But his faith and his trust in God have grown and matured. That's what we're seeing. This growth results in a hymn of praise in chapter 3 or a prayer. We see this throughout the Old Testament in particular, these kinds of moments where the prophets or the psalmist will break forth in prayer of praise and thanksgiving to, to God. And, and so this growth and maturity and, and trust and hope in God breaks forth in this, this prayer that really rehearses for us God's deliverance of his people from captivity in Egypt and how he brought them into the promised land. Unfortunately, oftentimes our growth is stunted because we want circumstances to change more than we want spiritual growth and maturity to occur. This is, this is what we're being faced with as we look at it. Keep in mind, Habakkuk's circumstances have not changed, but his faith and hope in Jesus Christ has matured and grown. And we will have this same experience if we will be willing to walk through it. So this is why we need to study books like Habakkuk and why this final chapter that we're going to look at this morning is so important for our own journey of faith and trust. Habakkuk teaches us in this final chapter that even though uh, we may be uncertain and even for fearful for the days ahead of us, we can experience peace as we rest in the faithfulness of God. And so let's pray and ask God to use his word this morning to help us understand that. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to look into your word and to experience through the life of Habakkuk what it really means to walk by faith in dark and difficult times. To not only walk through it, but to experience your peace your hope, your joy, to be able to express worship in the midst of it all. God, help us to see that this morning. Use your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this passage is fairly easy. It's, a, it's 19 verses long. But the, the real issue is, what do I do now? You know, I, I, I've heard from God. God settled it. There's no more arguing. There's no more discussion. God said, this is what's going to happen. Just get ready for it. So what do I do now? And, and what happens in, in, in Habakkuk's life is that he, in verses 1 through 15, he breaks out in reflecting upon God's faithfulness. And the majority of this section is his hymn of praise or prayer. And then, then in verse 16 down through verse 19 is his declaration of faith for the future. As he brings this book to a close, he, he looks to the future and he makes this declaration, one of the most fantastic statements in all of Scripture, in my opinion, uh, happens in verses 16 through 19. As here's this man in the middle of the difficult, dark times, and it's, he's already been anxious about it, but now he's about ready to walk through it. It's one thing to be told what's going to happen, but it's another thing to be faced with the reality, it's happening and you have to live through it. And that's where he's at. But in the midst of all that, he breaks forth in praise and makes this declaration of faith. No matter what happens, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to trust you. 
And so let's look at, first of all, the, the reflection of God's past faithfulness. Now, look at verses 1 and 2, because as you see this passage, it's, it, it's talked about as it's designated as a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to this word that I can't really pronounce, shenigonoff or something like that. But most people will know that it's a, a, a musical term of some sort. We don't really know what it meant. It was a, an indication of how this, this section of Habakkuk was supposed to be handled. And as often is the case, these prayers of, of praise or prayers, uh, hymns of praise and prayer would, would be sung in times of worship. And you, as I've mentioned, you will see that this is a passage of Scripture that is uh, seen similarly in other places like Psalm 18, 68, Psalm 77, Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 33, all of which, which break out in these, these songs of praise and rehearsing God's faithfulness. But this prayer breaks forth, and there's a cause. There's a reason for it. We see it primarily in verse 2. It says, Oh, Lord, I have heard the report of you. I, I have heard what you said. I've made my complaint. You responded. I said, God, I, are, are you insensitive? Do you not see what's happening? Can't you take care of what's going on in your people? And God says, I am. Here's what I'm going to do. And then Habakkuk's response is, God, that's not fair. And then God's response is, this is what's going to happen, and here's why. And so Habakkuk says, Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Basically, where we, we find ourselves is Habakkuk's circumstances haven't changed. He has better understanding. In many ways, it's gotten worse. He knows what's going to happen. And so there's this issue, the full impact, the fear of what's about to take place is, is upon him. And he understands that God is going to use Babylon to discipline the nation of Judah. And so he makes this request in the latter part of verse 2. The cause is, God, I, I'm fearful of what you're doing, but here's my request. His request comes in twofold. One, remember or revive your power in our midst. This is what God promised in chapter 1, verse 5. Look at it. He says, in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst, midst of the years, make it known. I've heard of the work you're going to do. Revive it. Make it happen. Even though I don't want it, make it happen. God, do your work as you promised, okay? Revive your power in our midst. It's what God promised he was going to do. And now Habakkuk is saying, I understand it. I've heard it. I don't necessarily like it. But God, it's yours. Go for it. Do your work. But there's a second request that comes in all this because he knows, he knows who God is going to use. He knows the, ba the king of Babylon and his army and, and the difficulty that they will create. He knows the viciousness which, which they will move forth and the way that they have dealt with other nations. He knows all that. And so he says, God, all right, you said you're going to do a work. Do your work. Revive it. Make it happen. But... Remember mercy in the process. Remember mercy. You see, what Habakkuk wanted was a change in circumstances. What he wanted was is the God to do something to bring back the way the nation used to be under King Josiah when there was the reforms and everything was going right and, and people were following the Lord. That's what he wanted. He wanted a revival. And now he's crying out for mercy. See, I think Habakkuk understands that God has a right to do what he's doing. And God is in control of what he's doing. And all he's doing is saying, God, just have mercy on us. And after ask, making those requests, do your work, revive it, have mercy, he breaks out in this hymn of praise or prayer that it, we've seen over and over again. And there's really three stanzas that go along with it. Verses 3 through 5, he rehearses the glory of God. Verses 6 and 7, he, he rehearses the power in which God accomplished things. And then verse 
uh, 8 down through verse 15, he recounts how God has marched forth in victory. So let's look at it together. Just follow along as I read. In verse 3 it says, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. And he's really basically talking about Mount Zion and, and, and the area around Mount Sinai and, and where God spoke to um, Moses, where God spoke to the people in the wilderness. He talks about his glory. He says, his splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, rays flashing from his hands. And there he veiled his power. All right, and then verse five, and he stood, I mean, and before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. And so he's talking about his glory, the brightness. Now, if you recount the, the, the story of God delivering Egypt out, of, I mean, delivering Israel out of Egypt and all the different events, one of those events, you know that Moses went up on the mountain, Mount Sinai. And when he was up there, he spent time with God. And when he came down, the people asked him to veil his face. Why? Because it was so bright. Because he'd been in the presence of God. And so as you, as you read through this, he very poetically just talks about God. You came and you did your work in glory. This is what he wants to see now. God, do your work. And he recounts the fact that God came in glory and manifested his glory everywhere he went. Then verses 6 and 7, he talks about how he stood in power. God stood in power. Look, verse 6, he stood and he measured the earth. And this, this phrase is used throughout the Old Testament to describe somebody who owns it. In other words, he's measuring it to claim it. This is, this is mine, my, 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 my creation, my possession. And so God says, he, he, he says, God stood and he measured and he looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. He was, he, 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 his were the everlasting ways. And I saw the tents of Cushan and in the afflicted and the curtains of the land of the Midian did tremble. And, and he talks about God's power in verses 6 and 7. And when you study the story again of how God brought e the Israelites out of Egypt and, and how he brought them into the promised land, we see God's power over and over and over again displayed. And so Habakkuk is reflecting on God and how God has been faithful to work in the situations of man to accomplish his purposes. And he rehearses the fact that God demonstrated his glory. God stood in his power. There was nobody who could stand against him. And then verses 8 through 15, the larger section, the third stanza, it talks about God marching in victory. Listen to this. Listen to what he says. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many errors. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and withered. The raging waters swept on and the deep gave forth its voice and it lifted his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked. Laid him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows. And the heads of his warriors. Who came like a whirlwind to scatter me. Rejoicing as if it were to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses. And the surging of your mighty waters. God marches in victory. See, when, when God's ready, 
when God's ready to take a hold of this world, which we can, we can get very concerned about, what in the world? It's out of control. God, are you not on your throne? Not much different than what Habakkuk was saying. God, God, do you not see what's happening? Can't you do something about it? God says, yes, I can. And then, as he works his way through it, Habakkuk does, he comes to this point where he rehearses and he remembers. He remembers again how God has acted in the past, and that gives him confidence in the present. You see, continual reflection on how God has acted faithfully in history builds our confidence for the present and the future work of God. When our circumstances seem unbearable, when our circumstances seem beyond us, we can remember and we can reflect. That's why here's what Habakkuk is doing. Habakkuk is reflecting back on what he has already heard and been told and read himself about how God delivered Israel from Egypt. Now God's telling him Babylon's coming and Babylon's going to take you captive. And guess what? If God could deliver him from Egypt, he could deliver him from Babylon. Guess what? Egypt rose as a world empire, and they went down. Babylon rises as a world empire, and guess what? It will come down, and it doesn't matter today what power rises. God's still on the throne, and when he's ready to march, there is nobody who's going to stop him. He will accomplish his purposes. That's what we hold on to. And so when we get all... Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, no. Surely the Lord's coming back today. Yes, he may. But he may wait a long time. You say, oh, I don't know. I don't know if it can get any worse. I heard that from my father. My father heard that from his father. And I said it to my children. And perhaps children after that, my children will say it to their children. It doesn't matter how long. But when he's ready, he will March in glory and in power and victory. And nobody will stop him. And so that's why we need to spend time in his word. That's why we need to hold on to the promises of the past and how God has worked. And no matter how ugly, no matter how dark and difficult it may get now, we hold on to the fact that God will march in victory. We may not see the victory in our lifetime. But he will march in victory. He will accomplish his purposes. And so continual reflection, spending time in the word, reflecting on how God has, has delivered his people, how God has acted in history, and be reminding them over and over again. I, I met with uh, a young man this week, and we were, we were going through this book, and one of the stories is about how God caused the sun to stand still. And he goes, Pastor Charlie, I don't think I ever heard that story. Now, you have to ask the question. I'm not going to reveal his name because his parents are here. <laughs> My guess is he probably wasn't listening. But he grew up going to church, never heard it. And we had this wonderful conversation talking about how God powerfully held the sun in place in order for him and his people to rout the enemy and accomplish his purposes. You see, if God can cause the sun to stand still, if he can cause all of that keeps moving on every day, there's none of us in here that can do that. If God can do that, he can handle whatever little problem or big problem we may be facing today. And so we keep going back to it. We keep going back to it over and over and over again. God, this is what you've done. And right now it's dark, but I hold on in confidence for the future because of what you've done. That's what Habakkuk's doing. He's, he's rehearsing it and he's worshiping God. God, you are the God who marches in glory. You are the God who stands in power. You are the God who marches in victory, and I trust you. I trust you. 
And that's where we find ourselves at, the, at this point. After rehearsing this and singing this song of praise and, and, and prayer, Habakkuk comes to this declaration of faith for the future. And in this declaration of faith, there are three commitments and three applications. They're, they're related to one another. And, and here's what I want us to see. If we're really going to live and walk by faith, it's not, it's not something that, that uh, we just sit around and wait for God to zap us with mighty faith. It, it's a matter of trusting in his character and stepping forth and saying, God, I trust you. And I'm going to face whatever it is. So look at these three commitments in verses 16 through 19, which then lead us to three applications. Notice with me, if you will, verse 16. He says this, I hear and my body trembles. Here we are back to the fear again. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. He is, he is in the moment of huge anxiety, worry. He says, this is the way I'm feeling physically. Then he says this, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Yet I will wait. Now notice, he's not waiting for God to deliver his people. He's waiting for God to take care of those who are going to invade God's people. He says, I will wait. Even though I'm afraid about what's going to happen, even though I'm concerned about what's going on, even though my anxiety levels are way out of whack to the point that physically I can't stand, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. In other words, God, I'm going to wait for you to do your work. Now notice he says quietly. What has the first two chapters been about? They've been about Habakkuk saying, hey, God, I got something for you here. I, I, maybe you haven't considered, but do you not see what's happening around us? Aren't you going to do something? Are you being that insensitive? Come on. And then God answers him, and he goes, well, that's not fair. And you can almost get a, a picture of a little baby going, <laughs> that's not fair. No, and God says, no, this is what I'm going to do. And now Habakkuk says, I fear, I tremble, I can't hardly stand, but I will wait quietly for you to do what you have to do. You see, there's a moment of surrender that's going on. God, I, I, I don't understand, I don't know why, but I'm going to quietly wait on the Lord. Second commitment that we see here and then here's what it says in verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines. In other words, even if I don't see the restoration, even if I don't see things corrected in my lifetime, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will Rejoice in the Lord. I will wait and I will rejoice in the Lord. Not in my circumstances, but in who you are, God. I will rejoice in the Lord. There's one final commitment here that we see in verse 19. And it says this, or verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the world, Lord, and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deers or hinds. He, he makes me tread on high places. Third commitment. I will rely on the Lord. The Lord will be my strength. You see, Habakkuk can't face what he's up against by himself. He can't face it in his own strength. He, 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 he's just simply going to have to wait on the Lord to do what he's going to do. He's going to rejoice, worship God in the midst of it, and then allow God's strength to be his strength. And that leads us to the three applications from this passage. And they're very simple. And they're easier said than done. 
But here's the applications that we see as we look at Habakkuk as he struggled his way through on this journey of faith and he's seen what God's going to do and he's struggling with it. Here's what it is. There, there are three. My inner peace, verse 17, my inner peace will not be dependent on circumstances. You see, this is where we get it really off because we're, we're so worried about our circumstances and the way we think things should change or the way we think they should go. And when they're going the way we think, we, we're, there, there's peace. But when they're not, where does that peace come from? It comes only from the Lord when Habakkuk says, I will wait quietly. My inner peace will not be dependent on my circumstances. Verse 17. Application number two. Where he talks about, I will rejoice. My inner joy will not be dependent upon my circumstances. My joy is in the Lord. That's what he says. I will rejoice in the Lord. My circumstances, not so much. But I will rejoice in the Lord. My inner peace will not be dependent on my circumstances, verse 17. My inner joy will not be dependent upon my circumstances, verse 18. And then final application. My inner strength will not be dependent on my circumstances. It matters not what piles up against me. My strength isn't based on how much I can do or how strong I may be. My strength is based on what God can and will do. You see, here's, here's the point. Here's the conclusion of the book, in my opinion. You can wrap it up this way. A faithful God deserves a faithful people who trust him in the moment and with the future. And that's easier said than done. Because when you are faced and you are in the midst of these dark and difficult times, the only thing we can do is just hang on and trust in God. That's what Habakkuk's teaching us. How do we live by faith? We hang on and we trust. A year or so ago, uh, Todd Durant and I went on a fishing trip. It was sort of a bucket list for me to go fish Lake Okeechobee for the big bass. We didn't catch them. Um, five or six pounds, that was about it. Which is good, but I was looking for bigger. And on the day we went, we had all kinds of excuses for why we didn't catch the big ones. The main one was a cold front came through. And with that cold front came northwest winds blowing about 20, 30 miles an hour. That's not fun to be on any lake when it's blowing that way. Lake Okeechobee is very shallow. And so we, were, we would maneuver around into places, but that wind always found us as we were fishing. And the boat would be doing this. And I, I have a, a struggle with motion sickness. Generally, I don't get motion sick on freshwater bass boats. But this day, there were a couple of times when I'm like, because <clears throat> it was just, Whoo. well, we fished and we went to every covered spot we could find. Most of the fish weren't there, but we were at least able to stand on the boat without fearing falling in. Then there came the moment when it was time for our allotted fishing time to be done and our guide was going to take us back. I had no idea where we were. When we left in the morning before the sun came up, the wind was light. It was dark. I have no idea. Lake Okeechobee's big and I had no idea where we were. And the fishing guide looks at us and says, listen, when we leave this particular area, and we go out into the bigger part of the lake, which we have to do, the waves are going to be very high, like four, five feet, six feet. And he said, there's only one way for us to get back to the other side where we need to go, to the boat launch, is that when we get out there, you better hang on because I'm going to gun it. Now, that sounded reasonable until we got out of the covered area and I saw these waves. And after the first or second kidney adjustment, I realized, I don't want to do this. 
I don't want to go through this. We got a long ways to go, and there's nothing but waves in front of me, and the boat's doing this. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And I'm in a little bitty bass boat. I'm holding on for dear life. I'm not, I'm not holding on to Todd because if he goes, I don't want to go. He's not holding on to me. And we're just bare, white knuckled, hanging on. And all we can do is just trust that this guy knows what he's doing. He's fished this lake a lot. He knows what it means. And all we can do is gun it. And he says, because if we don't gun it, we're going to sink. Those aren't good options. <laughs> we flew across that thing. I, I swore that boat was going to break in a million pieces. But all I could do was hang on and trust. That's the way life can be sometimes. And when God says this is the only path, then we better hang on and trust because that's what Habakkuk says. That's what we learn as we walk through. He doesn't tell us. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't say, oh, this is going to be wonderful. He says, my bones feel that you're rotten. I feel like I'm going to collapse. But God, I'm going to trust you. And even if I don't see what you're going to do eventually, I'm going to hold on to you. And you will get me through. A faithful God deserves a faithful people who will trust him in the moment, no matter how dark it is. And with the future, no matter how uncertain it may be. Because he is faithful. So we reflect on his faithfulness in the past which gives us confidence to face the future and the moment. And we worship him in the midst because he's faithful. Easier said than done. But it is the growth that God wants to do in each and every one of us. But remember what I said. Oftentimes, our spiritual growth and maturity is stunted because we want God to change our circumstances more than we want to experience growth and maturity. Habakkuk's message is, hang on and trust God and grow in your faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. The most amazing thing about your word is that you never sugarcoat it. You always give it to us straight. Habakkuk could have talked about Oh, I know you're going to deliver. Oh, I know you're going to make things better. He says, even if the fig tree doesn't bloom, I'll trust you. He says, no matter if, if everything else is cut off, all source of income, all source of sustenance is gone and destroyed, I will trust you. I will hang on to you. And Lord, I know there's people in this audience today that are experiencing some of those dark difficult circumstances and it's really hard and it's really scary but all we can do is hang on to you our faithful God and God I pray that you will you will give the night song that we will be able to rejoice in who you are and in your faithfulness and we will trust you to make it through. Regardless of the circumstances, we will trust you. We'll be sure to give you the praise for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.